Yesterday, I played an over-the-board game that not only features one, not just two, not even three, but five brilliant moves in a row! Absolutely insane! I was beyond surprised seeing this because I did not expect this whatsoever. It did feel like one of the cleanest way to win a chess game and it was super super smooth, but five brilliant moves in a row? I was shocked when I saw this and I cannot wait to show you what happened in this game. Before we jump into the game, let me explain you real quick where this game happened and so on. So this game is from the Dutch League. The Dutch League is a competition where a club uh, has a team of 10 players against another club with 10 players. So 10 versus 10. So if you win 6 to 4, you win as a team and you win 2 match points for the overall scoreboard. And of course, also individual score matters as we're playing here for FIDE rating. So of course, I also want to win really badly for myself. Now the beauty of league competitions is that you do not know your opponent in advance. You do know who you're facing, which team you're facing that is, but you don't know on which board which player is sitting. So I was put on board 5 and I have no idea who I'm facing in particular. I know that I'm playing with white pieces, but that's about it. So there's very little preparation, which makes up for very fun, creative games and very little prep, which is, you know, pretty much awesome these days. So going into this game, I also don't particularly know the strength of my opponent. Sometimes you recognize your opponent, but this time I didn't, so I had no idea what the rating was of my opponent, and it basically during the game you have to do some sort of guess the elo to estimate the strength of your opponent. Let's take a look at the game. So I played move e4, of course. e5 was played by my opponent, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. This is the Roy Lopez a6, bishop a4, this is pretty much the main line, knight f6, this knight is of course attacking my pawn on e4, there are lines where white goes short castle, but this is going into the Berlin line, and we all know that the Berlin defense is not really what we're looking for here, right? So I played a move d3, simply defending the pawn on e4, and stepping out of any sort of Berlin, but also martial attacks. We don't like those two openings, no. d6 was played by my opponent, now here the threat is that Black is preparing to move b5, bishop b3, and knight a5. And guess what? This bishop becomes very unhappy. It will be captured by this knight, and we're not really into that. We want to keep this light squared bishop as much as we can. This is why we play the move c3. This pawn d6 is simply defending the pawn e5, which allows this knight to move around freely after b5. So you gotta be careful to keep your bishop alive and if needed, slide it back to c2. Now my opponent played bishop e7, short castle, short castle, knight bd2. This may look a little bit strange, but in a few moves you will see where this knight is heading to. Rook e8, rook e1, simply developing moves, right? Bishop f8, now this bishop is preparing to jump over to g7 after the move g6, where it is defending the king and doing a bit more effort than when it's sitting on e7. It's not doing much there, so this is a very reasonable move. I played move knight f1, so the knight is jumping around, where is it heading to? And my opponent played move h6, so this is not allowing me to play any sort of bishop g5, which seemed very appealing now that the bishop is gone to f8. And after a move like, for example, d5, I'm heavily considering playing bishop g5, because now the threat is that I do want to capture on e d5, and if they capture on e4, I'm not too concerned. This knight needs to be a little bit careful. Knight g3, that is where the knight was heading to, and the reason why is because this knight wants to jump really badly to f5. This knight wants to get there with the support of the other knight, or maybe not even needed, but typically you want to place a knight there and capture back. In case of bishop takes f5, you capture back with this knight. So we'll see what happens, but that is the main idea in this opening. One of the main ideas, that is. Bishop d7, h3 now. I thought, you know, my opponent is making sort of waiting moves. I can also make waiting moves, and 
of course, I want to play the move d4 to simply control the center and open up some files. But after the move d4, if I would have played d4 right here, I wasn't too happy with moves like bishop g4. Of course, if d5, but it would get a bit too complicated and I was not really into this. I just wanted to be very safe and see what my opponent would basically do. I played the move h3, knight e7. So, of course, black is really happy to trade those bishops. My bishop is a really strong bishop, so I'm not really into this. I'm sliding my bishop back to b3 and also at the same time eyeing on this pawn on f7 because it is only defended by the king and the king is not a great defender as we know. c5 which is a strange move I have to say but the idea is clear that my opponent wants to sort of stop any sort of d4. I can still consider it but it's a very typical idea to play this move c5 in the Ruy Lopez. The only thing is that typically this is included with the move b5, so I'm not sure how effective this is, as it is also weakening the pawn d6, but okay, I can see where this is coming from. I play the move knight h4 because my plan is clear. I want to get to f5. I'm also eyeing on the move knight h5 because as you can probably already see, if knight takes, the queen can join the attack and all of a sudden it gets really tricky for black over here. So black needs to be pretty careful about this. This setup with knight on e7, pawn on c5 without playing b5, it's a little bit unusual. And also playing h6 instead of g6 is also causing some issues here and there. So you'll see what happened because of this in the next few moves. So here my opponent played move bishop e6 and this was a really interesting move because it challenges my bishop and once again I don't want to trade this bishop. This bishop on b3, the light squared bishop of white, is the Spanish bishop. If there's one piece you do not want to trade, it's this very bishop. However, the trade was really appealing to me because you have to think of it this way. If I now go back to c2, very safe and sound, typically this is very standard, very normal in the Ruy Lopez, but when you look at it this way, it looks pretty difficult for me to see right now where my bishop will be heading to. I can push d4, but it doesn't really seem like I can quickly get an attack going. And at the same time, my opponent has d5 all prepared. It's now ready to push d5. And while this bishop is alive, I also have small difficulties going for knight f5 just yet, because of course there's two pieces defending f5, and after all those trades on f5, d5 will be able to be played, and I'm not so sure where my advantage is. That's when I started thinking, maybe it is okay to take here. I mean, for what it's worth, if I capture on e6, pawn takes, there will be doubled pawns, and eventually I decided I have to take. And the reason why is because look what square got suddenly very vulnerable. The square g6. All of a sudden, this knight is eyeing that square and there's no pawn defending it anymore. And originally, I was slightly concerned about knight g6 maneuvers causing me to have to move around and... Yeah, this knight on g6 would have been a really good defender. But now, the knight cannot jump to g6. That square is mine and I'm going to take it. And this is why I decided to capture on e6 because I have a clear plan. I'm going for that square and eventually axes the king. Let me show you how I did that. Knight h5. There the knight goes. We're getting rid of one of the defenders of the king. And at the same time, I want to involve more and more and more pieces to start attacking on the king. Knight c6 was played by my opponent, which is very logical because after a capture here, the queen will be able to capture now and try to defend the king more or less. I decided to ignore it and played rook e3. Knight h7, which was played by my opponent, opening up the queen towards my knight, so my knight is now under attack. Of course, I play knight g6, and here my opponent went back to e7, offering the trade because, yeah, my knight is pretty strong, so I can understand where this is coming from. I played with rook g3. So I'm going in with my rook here because I felt like, okay, I can involve my queen over here, but I can always do that. Let's take some time to involve the rook first. And yeah, I really wanted to have my rook on g6 eventually, which actually happened because my opponent captured on g6, rook takes, and now white is having a huge advantage. Why? There are many problems in black's position. So first of all, 
Bishop takes h6 is a huge threat. There's a pawn hanging, and at the same time, I'm also threatening to play queen g4, attacking the pawn, and also another pawn on e6. And around this time, my opponent was already in some time trouble, which gave me a lot of confidence because, well, I had so much time. I had around 30 minutes on the clock, or 40 minutes maybe even, which is very rare. Um, around move 20, it's me in time trouble, not my opponent. I was in a very good spot already, but I also knew that this position must be winning because I'm just winning a pawn. I am very confident of this and I don't see how my opponent can really do anything here because look how passive the pieces are. Almost all of them are on the 8th rank. This knight on h7 is doing nothing whatsoever. So yeah, I like my chances here. My opponent went for king h8, stepping out of that pin over here. So bishop takes h6 is not really hanging, right? Queen g4. This is still a double attack. This is still threatening to take on g7 and also to take on e6. And that might be pretty easy to defend, right? You can simply play move like queen e7 or queen d7. Well, here's a problem. My opponent went for rook e7, which is very understandable to defend g7. But the problem is, bishop takes h6. This pawn is absolutely hanging. Why? After g takes h6, it is simply checkmate on g8. This bishop is absolutely ruining everything for black over here. Now, this did not happen in the game, of course, but look what potential there is when all your pieces are pretty much active and your opponent's pieces are so passive. Because if this bishop wasn't here, this wouldn't have been a threat whatsoever. And this bishop is as stuck as a piece can be. My chat is always making fun of me for playing with the French, with the French bishop and so on, but I've never seen such a bad piece like this bishop on f8. <laughs> All right, so my opponent went for queen d7 because as I took on h6, I'm also attacking the pawn on g7. So that needs to be defended, of course. And here I thought, okay, I have a really crushing position. But where is the final blow? How is this not checkmate or just straight up winning on the spot? I have to work a bit harder for the full point here. So I thought, well, all my pieces over here are doing something, which is attacking g7, let's involve more pieces. Rook e1, the second brilliant move. Why? Because I'm simply letting my bishop just be on holidays over here. You know, it cannot be captured. Nobody can touch this bishop whatsoever. So it's just chilling there. Rook a8, my opponent wants to reinforce and yeah, play rook f7, rook e7, so that the pawn g7 will have more coverage. I'm simply continuing my plan. Rook e3. There we go, once again, another brilliant move. And why? Because this bishop is a loose bishop and is still on vacation. <laughs> rook f7 was playing, and here, once again, rook g3. There we go, another brilliant move. So, rook e7, because, well, you need to defend this pawn as much as you can. Pretty much all the pieces are both attacking that pawn g7 and defending the pawn. So that's pretty crazy. So here is a really interesting moment. I had, I believe, around 30 minutes currently. My opponent was playing around like a few minutes on the clock. And I started thinking like, okay, I have a brilliant position. I have everything I could wish for. All my pieces are attacking in the right spot. But where is the final blow? Like, those pieces over here are so, so, so passively bad in any shape or way possible. But how do I win? Well, the nice part is, is that Black doesn't have any single move. Black li can literally not move anything. Okay, you can move the pawns, but the pieces are stuck. This bishop can't move. If you move the knight, you'll lose on the spot. This rook can't move. Literally doesn't have any square available. If this rook moves, they lose a pawn on g7, and then the, the whole game. This queen can move, but you gotta be really careful there to, you know, you have to support this pawn g7 once again. It's a really, really strange position, and I start to think about moves like knight f6, bishop g5, moving the bishop all the way back to e3, so that maybe we can start attacking on the h-file instead. 
So I started to calculate everything and I was going crazy because I could not spot the win right away. It was so hard for me to see the winning move and that's why I went for the move Queen H4. So this move looks really odd and not a brilliant move. And yeah, the idea is simple. I want to place my queen on this H file because as soon as my bishop moves, there will be knight of six type of ideas. I will go through the line shortly because my opponent went for queen a4, trying to create some counterplay with queen d1 check. The king will have to move, rook takes f2, and then it may get a little bit shaky. So I gotta be careful here. I'm realizing this, and once again, I don't see what I could do right on the spot. Apparently, so this was not played in the game, apparently bishop takes g7, knight takes g7, even rook takes g7, literally anything wins in this position, which is crazy. My head started to hurt during the game because I was like, how can I not win this? Because I was calculating the lines, but I could not spot the win right away. It got very complicated. And knowing that I have such a wonderful position that every single move pretty much wins makes me feel like I should not take the risk and take on g7. But I did calculate some lines, which I want to show you right now. First and foremost, I went through all the captures, of course. Rook takes g7, not so, because I wanted to keep my rooks over here. Because in my head, I am calculating, I'm visualizing, I should say, some checkmate patterns. I want to set up a checkmate pattern where I play knight of six and I somehow get to play rook g8 checkmate or queen takes h7 somehow. At the same time, I'm not really able to make it happen. It's not that easy. So ideally, you would want to have such a position like this, knight over here, and then after rook takes, rook takes, I mean, Checkmate was over here, checkmate over here, but yeah, I wasn't really seeing, of course, how this would happen precisely because, of course, after bishop takes g7, there's also bishop takes g7, and after bishop takes g7, you can play knight takes, and this is obviously, like, absolutely winning, but I was not really impressed during the game. I wanted more. I wanted to have a checkmate, a forced one, preferably, so... I could not really see where this was heading to. I also considered knight of six, and of course, g takes f6 is not possible because of rook g8 checkmate. If knight takes, which is also what I calculated, you take on g7 and simply checkmate on h8, as bishop takes g7 was a double check. I also want to show you one more line I calculated, which was along the lines of knight takes, and then, for example, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, and here you play queen takes e7 because now rook takes e7 is stepping into a checkmate on g8 one more time and if you don't take it well rook takes g6 rook takes g6 i mean of course i'm ahead material but you're also getting checkmated really quickly so all in all a very unpleasant position for black but i wasn't really feeling confident because it wasn't really forced i wasn't really satisfied by the fact that it wasn't quite forced i want to have a bit more reassurance that I'm actually winning this game rather than throwing it to let's say move like queen d1 check I don't know so I want to take it a bit more easy and be a little bit more patient because if you strike too early if you're going for that brilliancy of a game with like crazy sacrifices I've been there where you know, I would throw the game and still lose while I was completely winning I did not want to have that happen today so that's why I went for the move bishop g5. Safe and sound, simply preparing moves like knight of 6 quietly. We're not in a rush, because of course after knight takes g5, now there's knight of 6 and checkmate on h7, so that is no, no bueno. And I'm attacking the rook on e7, so what can you do here? If you simply move the rook, then I will consider moves like knight of 6, because now my queen is attacking the knight, my bishop is also defending that knight on f6, so I felt like... There were many more reasons for me to now play knight f6 than a move before when the bishop was still on h6. That's why I went for bishop g5. And here my opponent went for queen d1 check indeed, king h2, rook takes f2. And here I was like, okay, are we gonna try to win it in style or are we just gonna capture that rook on e7 that is simply hanging? And I did consider going for the move knight f6, which would have been really, really awesome and pretty. But I also didn't want to take a risk because... There is a free rook hanging, just take it, right? So I just took the rook and I knew that after rook f1, which is threatening checkmate, I can see people lose this online when they pre-move or just didn't expect black to have any counterplay because that is a checkmate threat. But over the board, when I have 20 minutes on the clock, I know there's rook f3. 
after takes pawn takes and there's nothing happening my pawn resigned here and i felt like i had one of the most cleanest most smooth games ever this was absolutely amazing my team ended up winning eight to two we did play against some of the weaker teams so it was expected we would win but still eight to two is a pretty nice score and i was really happy with my win beating a 2100 rated player and yeah we're going up in the ratings in the next month i will probably have a rating of 2169 so that is pretty nice not only am i happy for my team of course but i'm also happy that i played such a nice game it doesn't happen every single day that you play five brilliant moves in a row i mean i was shocked when i saw this because i did not expect it whatsoever i just thought like it all seemed pretty logical to me so it didn't really feel like anything too crazy but when i opened the game review i was shocked and pleasantly surprised i guess i hope you all enjoyed the video make sure to give it a like Give it a thumbs up, drop a comment down below in the comments what you thought of this game. Were you surprised? Were you shocked? Do you think you would have seen it yourself? Let me know in the comments and I hope to see you in the next video.